on World News Tonight. AUKUS arrives. All eyes on the big three as global nations decry the pact. Goodbye, Mercron. Merkel and Macron reminisce their long and prosperous ties in a visage of farewell. Hybrid immunity. Possible hope of fighting future pandemics may be within the human body itself. Floating away. Astronaut wannabes take a four trip for a zero gravity experience. From the global resources of the Venona Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from a brand new security pact in the Indo-Pacific. The recent signing of a security pact by the US, Britain and Australia is being seen as one of the biggest defense alliances formed in decades. However, the agreement named AUKUS has not been welcomed in some quarters, with China among those sharply critical of the move. China on Thursday condemned a new Indo-Pacific security alliance between the United States, Britain and Australia, dubbed AUKUS, which would provide Australia with the technology and capability to deploy nuclear-powered submarines. AUKUS, it sounds strange and all these acronyms, but it's, it's a good one. China's foreign ministry said the three countries were, quote, severely damaging regional peace and stability, intensifying an arms race and damaging international nuclear non-proliferation efforts. And the backlash is not just coming from China. France lost its own submarine deal with Australia as a result of the U.S. deal. French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian called the plans brutal and unpredictable and accused Biden of stabbing France in the back and acting like his predecessor, Donald Trump. On Thursday, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki pushed back. Uh, but we are engaged closely, and we were engaged uh, in advance of this announcement uh, with leaders in France uh, about uh, about uh, this they purchase. Were uh, they were aware in advance of the announcement, yes. EU foreign policy chief Josep Borrell said he was not consulted on Wednesday's agreement. I guess a deal of this nature wasn't cooked up the other day. It takes a while. Despite that, no, we were not consulted. No. The U.S. and its allies are looking for ways to push back against China's growing power and influence, particularly its military buildup. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin on Thursday said the pact was about more than just countering China. This morning we had a robust discussion across the full range of those security interests to include terrorism, climate change and the increasingly contested security environment in the Indo-Pacific. We spoke in detail about China's destabilizing activities in Beijing's efforts to coerce and intimidate other countries, contrary to established rules and norms. The U.S., U.K. and Australia all stressed it would not be fielding nuclear weapons, but that Australia would be using nuclear propulsion systems for the vessels to guard against threats. U.S. officials did not give a time frame for when Australia would deploy a nuclear-powered submarine or how many would be built. French President Emmanuel Macron is to meet with German Chancellor Angela Merkel in Paris to discuss international crises and European issues days before elections that will mark the end of a 16 years in office. A friendship and a meeting of minds that's been the bedrock of the European Union for the last four years. The two leaders are light-heartedly known as Macron, that portmanteau and nod to the deep commitment that both Macron and Merkel have had to maintaining solid ties, despite some clear differences on policy when it comes to EU issues. The French president has made no secret of his admiration for his counterpart's neighbourly approach. Everything that the Franco-German relationship is owes a debt to your commitment, your willingness to take action, sometimes your patience with us and your ability to listen. And so thank you very much for that. The last four years have seen Berlin and Paris grapple with the UK exit from the European Union, a tense relationship with the Trump administration and the effects of the coronavirus crisis, when Macron and Merkel worked together to design a massive bailout fund despite Germany's historical resistance to collective borrowing schemes. Indeed, Merkel's successor will have that post-pandemic financial landscape to deal with 
in addition to the existing challenges faced by the Eurozone. Foreign policy on Russia could also cause friction, with Paris open to negotiations with Moscow, while Berlin has given Vladimir Putin the cold shoulder of late. Yet the next German chancellor is unlikely to go it alone, since across the border in France there's a strong relationship to build on, defined by pragmatism and frank exchanges, as well as the sort of solidarity and affection never better illustrated than when Macron and Merkel stood shoulder to shoulder in a very symbolic ceremony, one century after the armistice of November 11, 1918. Leaders in West Africa gathered for a discussion on the future of Guinea's governance and how the country can be returned to constitutional normalcy. West African leaders gathered in Ghana's capital city, Accra, on Thursday to decide how they can steer Guinea back towards constitutional rule after a coup ousted President Alpha Conde last week. The 15-nation Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, condemned the coup and has suspended Guinea from the bloc's decision-making bodies. The leaders were to hear a report from a ministerial mission that went to Guinea's capital, Conquery, on Friday to meet the ruling junta. Ghana's president, Nana akufo Addo, is the ECOWAS chairman. We are required to take informed decisions on these matters that will have long-term consequences for the stability and the defense of the democratic values of our region. I count on you, Excellencies, to help proffer durable solutions to the crisis. And I'm confident that, as in the past, we will rise to the occasion. The junta in Guinea, led by Mamadi Dumbuya, a former member of the French Foreign Legion, is holding consultations with various public figures, groups and business leaders in the country to map a framework for a transitional government. As part of the four-day consultation, the junta will meet with Guinea's main business lobby and executives of mining firms operating in its auxite, gold, iron ore and diamond sectors. The junta has not said how long the transitional government will last or who will lead it. Residents of the Russian Far East city were among the first voters who went to the polls to elect a new parliament in the three-day vote that the ruling United Russia party is expected to win despite a rating slump after the biggest crackdown of the Kremlin's critics in years. Let's cross over to Adhidhar World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja who joins us now from Kursk in Russia for more. Malsha. Yes, Shanali. The vote is a test of President Vladimir Putin's grip on power across 11 time zones from the Pacific Ocean to Baltic Sea as the Kremlin faces malaise at the home over faltering living standards and dire ties with the West. At stake is United Russia's supermajority in the 450-seat state Duma, which last year helped Putin ease through constitutional reforms that allow him to run for the office again and potentially stay in power until 2036. The vote is being held al alongside elections for regional governors and local legislative assemblies. It is stretched over three days as a COVID-19 precaution. A move critics me say means that monitoring efforts to stop water fraud that spread more thinly. The elections in Moscow and several regions will feature the widespread use of electronic voting for the first time and innovation critics fear is non-transparent and open to abuse. The Kremlin critics have accused the authorities of using dirty tricks to sabotage their campaigns. It is the first time in United Russia has campaigned for votes in cast Ukraine territory held by the Moscow-backed separatists where Russia has handed out 600,000 Russian passports infuriating Ukraine. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. The European Commission announced plans for a new chip making ecosystem to keep the EU competitive and self sufficient after global semiconductor shortage showed the hazards of relying on Asian and US suppliers. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani. Yes, Shanali. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said in a policy speech at the European Parliament that digital is the make-or-break issue. 
Industry Commissioner Thierry Breton said chips were more than just key components for automakers, smartphone makers and video gamers. Breton said a European Chips Act would encompass research, production capacity and international cooperation and that the bloc should look into setting up a dedicated European semiconductor fund. A shortage of semiconductors has posed one of the biggest risks to the EU rebound from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The Commission's last year unveiled plans to invest a fifth of its 750 billion euro COVID-19 recovery fund in a digital project. Von der Leyen lamented that EU reliance on Asian-made chips and its diminished share in the supply chain from design to manufacturing capacity. However, hurdles to building up European chip capability including getting access to rare earth minerals outside the bloc and reluctance by companies to make hefty investments unless they can run the plant at its full capacity to boost returns. Back to you, Shanali. Thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back now for the latest updates on the COVID pandemic. Italy has become the first European country to make COVID-19 certificates mandatory for all workers. The decision was made as part of an effort by the country to boost vaccination. However, this decision has not been without controversy and polarized response from the public. Italy is set to become the first European country to make a COVID-19 green pass mandatory for all workers. It is a digital or paper certificate showing someone has received at least one vaccine dose, tested negative or recently recovered from the disease. The decree was expected to come into force on October 15 for both public and private sector workers. Any workers who fails to present a valid pass will be suspended on no pay but cannot be sacked. People who ignore the decree and go to work without possessing the health certificate will face a fine of up to 1,000 euros or 1,175 US dollars. There have been sporadic protests in recent weeks against the growing pressure to get a jab. But most political parties in the country have backed mandatory COVID passes, hoping it will prevent further economic lockdowns. While the Employers' Federation also welcomed the move, unions have been lukewarm and are demanding that tests should be given freely to those who refuse to be vaccinated. Officials have pushed back on this, saying it would encourage people to keep on shunning vaccines. Around 74% of Italy's population have had at least one COVID-19 shot, and 68% are fully vaccinated. We have some good news for you. New research has found that some people who catch COVID-19 and are later vaccinated develop incredible strong immunity to the virus. It's being dubbed superhuman immunity. New research shows some people may have a significantly higher level of immunity to COVID-19 that could even protect them from future pandemics. Scientists studied individuals who have recovered from the virus and then later received an mRNA vaccine such as Pfizer or Moderna. What they found was that protection against the disease and its variants was higher than immunity conferred by either infection alone or vaccine alone. Paul Binash is a virologist at the Rockefeller University. He prefers the term hybrid rather than superhuman immunity. So this is a phenomenon that, that we and others have uncovered in people who were infected by SARS-CoV-2 uh, early in the pandemic. And then some months later, when vaccines became available, they were vaccinated. Their antibodies were not only capable of neutralizing all of the SARS-CoV-2 variants that we have seen thus far, they're also capable of neutralizing viruses that are very much more diverse, including uh, the original SARS coronavirus, which is really quite different to the current ones, viruses that are currently circulating in bats and pangolins. Binash went on to urge caution, stressing that the research is new and needs more real-world testing. He said it did offer hope, though, 
for the people who had recovered from the disease and been vaccinated. His team is investigating whether a third booster shot has the same effect. So far, more than 226 million people around the world have been infected with COVID, and some 4.8 million people have died. The World Health Organization has said another flu pandemic is inevitable, that it is a matter of when, not if. Iran is the Middle Eastern country hardest hit by the coronavirus pandemic, with only 15% of the population vaccinated. Criticism is mounting inside the country as the new government has decided to speed up the vaccination campaign thanks to the arrival of new doses. This Tehran vaccination center is busy all day long. The pace of jabs picking up here amid the arrival of new imported doses. Officials say a record 1.6 million people were recently vaccinated in a single day. Authorities, though, are hoping to go even faster, aiming for 2 million daily inoculations. Priority is given to those with diabetes, students, and those over 40. Many Iranians are hopeful that a loosening of COVID restrictions could be coming soon. Out of 80 million inhabitants, some 24 million have gotten one dose. Only 12 million Iranians are fully vaccinated. Tehran had initially counted on locally developed vaccines, but production delays have forced authorities to seek out imports. Most of Iran's doses so far have come from China's Sinopharm vaccine, followed by Russia's Sputnik V. The government has promised 50 million more imported doses by the end of October. Ethiopians that have been driven out by the intense conflict within the country have received essential aid from in the International Red Cross. Ethiopians displaced by recent fighting in the country have received much-needed aid. Video from the International Committee of the Red Cross shows displaced people collecting supplies. The ICRC said the aid distribution started early last month and included items like blankets and lamps. War broke out in Tigray last November between government forces and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Thousands of people have been killed and more than two million forced to flee their homes. Mestuet Dubale is one of the displaced. Fighting has spread to Afar and Amhara in recent months, forcing around 450,000 more people to flee the two regions. According to the ICRC, just under 103,000 people have received emergency livelihood and shelter material in Tigray, Amhara and Afar since the start of August. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The International Atomic Agency revised up its projection of the potential growth of nuclear power capacity of electricity generation in the agency's first revision in 10 years. The World Bank Group has halted publication of its business climate report following a probe into data irregularities. The decision comes after internal audit reports raised ethical issues on the Doing Business 2018 and 2020 reports. The German government will grant visas to around 2,600 Afghan nationals. Among those on the visa list are those who have previously worked for German companies and organizations. Ford said it would boost production capacity for its F-150 Lightning to 80,000 per year due to strong demand for the electric pickup truck, adding that the vehicle would go on sale next spring. Britain's Prince Harry and his wife Meghan graced the cover of Time magazine's annual 100 Most Influential People in the World issue. The list also includes singers Billie Eilish and Britney Spears and the Olympic gymnast Simone Biles. The worst of Typhoon Chantu has passed Korea's southern island of Jeju, but typhoon alerts remain in effect for Busan and some southern parts of the country. While damage was reported across Jeju, no one was hurt. And finally tonight, as many of us watch with envy as billionaire space enthusiasts blast off into space, there is one way to feel what it is like to float weightlessly in the air. The zero gravity experience promises adventure travelers the ultimate experience, told by Zero G Corporation CEO Matt Gord. The experience is of what it feels like to be an astronaut, to float weightlessly in the cabin of a hollowed out cabin of a highly retrofied and customized Boeing 7. 
For the cost of $7,500 per person, people can now book a 90-minute trip on board the G-Force 1. Inside the modified plane, about two-thirds of it is open space to experience what it feels like when there is no gravity to hold you down. Participants can float, flip, do somersaults, hang upside down. Zero G has been offering flights since 2004 and this year God said that there will be 65 to 70 flights taking off from all across the United States. Amid the increased interest in space travel, God expects about 100 flights next year. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.